Where are type 1 diabetes medical devices headed in the future? Uh, we're going to talk about my 2023 predictions for insulin pumps, specifically on uh, algorithm-based devices, and uh, getting into a bit more about what is required for these devices to take over more of our control. If I can clip my pump back into my waistline, there we go. Uh, if you don't know who I am, my name is Matt Vandevecht. I live with type 1 diabetes, obviously. I am tethered to an insulin pump, uh, but I'm also a certified master fitness trainer and nutritionist author speaker type 1 diabetes is my life i love it i geek out on it and uh, this channel is dedicated to education and discussion around how to improve our lives with type 1 diabetes now today i want to talk about my 2023 prediction for t1d medical devices now this comes off of a, a great coaching call that i have with some of my clients i actually work with people on their blood sugars and uh, in this discussion they asked about uh, if insulin pumps are going to eventually have an option for an insulin to protein ratio and they asked for my opinions on this my thoughts and so I, we had a great discussion on the topic kind of covered a whole different array of uh, of variables that go into these insulin pumps how the algorithms work between tandem medtronic omnipod uh, bionic pancreas a lot of different options that are out there today now right now i'm using the tandem uh, t slim pump it has the control iq algorithm I use it sometimes. Um, used to use it all the time. I turn it off for most of my days. I use it during the night. There's different reasons for that and different ways that you can utilize the algorithm to your best benefit that might not be best use, right? They're kind of off label, but I'm not going to talk about those here today. Instead, my client's asking about, is there going to be an insulin to protein ratio, just like there's an insulin to carb ratio? I thought that was a fantastic question because the reality is we do need to have an insulin to protein ratio because we have to take that into consideration. We do need to have an insulin to fat resistance ratio just as much as we do an insulin to carb ratio. But the issue that most diabetics run into is that they don't care enough about those things to learn about them, or they just don't know what they don't know. And that's not our fault, right? It's not necessarily even our doctor's fault because they don't know. There's a lot of new research that shows that it's not just an insulin to carb ratio anymore. So my clients, having known this because we discuss these things on our, our coaching calls, we're asking about at what point do the insulin pumps need to take that into consideration? At what point will there be this adoption of new strategies? My personal thoughts are never. And it's unfortunate because those of us who do understand that we need insulin for a lot more than just the carbohydrates that we consume, there's a, this gap in the uh, adoption of these new methods. And of course, with the insulin pumps, they want to keep it simple. They want to make sure that it's widely used and accessible for everyone. If you start throwing insulin to protein ratios in there and somebody using the pump doesn't know that you need insulin for protein, you can see how that might get confusing, right? So 2023, I think that insulin to protein ratios are off. Uh, off the table. They're probably not going to be included for a very long time until we start seeing it adopted in the medical community, which will then educate the masses about us needing insulin to protein ratios. Until those of you who are here watching this video, listen to our podcast, you're obviously advanced. You're in the know. You're going to know things a lot more uh, readily than most people living with diabetes. So you share in my frustration that we're not going to see what we need for a very long time. That being said, a lot of different topics surrounding the algorithms itself. How do the algorithms work? Are the algorithms going to improve? Will the algorithms get to a place where we're able to rely completely or maybe 90% on the algorithms themselves to control our blood sugars for us? Now, there's two sides to this equation. One is the bionic pancreas. That's where we're headed. I believe that's going to be one of the next big steps. However, the current best situation within the bionic pancreas uh, race that I've seen is two different sites. So currently, I have one site. It delivers insulin from my insulin pump. This other option would have two sites, one to deliver insulin, one to deliver glucagon. So that way, if I'm high with my blood sugars, it delivers insulin. If I'm low, it'll deliver glucagon. Ideally, this would keep me in range, right? Of course, uh, the other side of the algorithm battle is that algorithms are a lagging indicator. They follow metrics that are already happening, meaning that they cannot plan ahead beyond a window of about 30 minutes. You know, this is where our CGMs are predicting our blood sugars are gonna go. Now, if you don't know what a CGM is, CGM is a continuous glucose monitor. I got one right here on my arm. 
and uh, it tells me what my blood sugars are every five minutes. It also communicates with my insulin pump. Now, this is the Tandem and Dexcom. It's what I wear currently. Uh, we've also seen Medtronic and their CGM, the Guardian. There's other CGMs on the market, like the Freestyle Libre, the Three. Uh, Eversense has a CGM. There's a number of other ones that are in, in development. Uh, we have the Omnipod pump that also communicates with Dexcom and you know, a whole array of options that are, are popping up now, which is great. However, with the algorithm basing its decisions on current information, now, the, the algorithms essentially say, okay, your blood sugar is this, and it's headed towards this, so we're going to make a decision to try to keep that from happening, right? So if I see blood sugars that are going up, it's likely going to give me more insulin to try to bring me back down, which would then uh, hypothetically improve my time in range. Now, the big issue with that is twofold. Number one, it does not take into consideration factors outside of the current situation. So, and that's not the fault of the pump. It just can't know what else is going on. These algorithms operate inside of a box, right? A black box where it can't see anything else. My pump does not know when I go to take a bite of something. It doesn't know if I'm about to go for a run, right? All it knows is blood sugars are either stable, rising, or falling. That's it. So it has to make its decisions based off of current blood sugar, the trending of the blood sugar, and existing insulin on board. It's all it's got. So the first issue is human error or human decision, right? And looking at how are we going to find this balance between what the decisions that I make and the decisions that my insulin pump makes. I have to kind of find a balance, find a way to work together with my pump. In this case, I would say working in tandem with tandem. <laughs> Had to throw a dad joke in there. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I've got a one-year-old now, so I officially am allowed to make dad jokes. But the second issue with these algorithms and why I think that we are far away from seeing any kind of reliance on these insulin pumps for us, you know, being able to say, hey, I don't have to worry about diabetes anymore because my insulin pump does everything for me. The reason that it's not going to happen in the near future, especially not in 2023, is that insulin does not work fast enough. So if our insulin pump is operating on current and potentially outdated information, blood sugars that are already happening, not where it's going to happen, right? It doesn't know if I'm about to eat, doesn't know if I'm about to exercise. The issue is that if I start to rise, let's say my blood sugar started at 120, I ate a sandwich, now we've got an arrow up at 170. Is it gonna catch it before I go out of range at 181? no chance <laughs> there is no chance that's going to happen and the reason for that is that even if it delivers insulin to catch that spike the insulin does not work fast enough to turn those blood sugars around and bring it back down just in time and the other side of that situation is that even if insulin did work that fast we'd be in for some trouble right because if insulin worked that fast it would turn around and then we'd crash so really the the true solution would be the bionic pancreas where if we can deliver both insulin and glucagon, if it can act as if it were a working pancreas, right? Which is why they call it the bionic pancreas, then that would enable us to have more freedom of choice provided that insulin works faster and glucagon works faster. Now, at the moment, like I said before, there's only one option and it's got two sites. Most people, myself included, aren't going to want to adapt to two sites when they've already had to adapt to one site plus a CGM. Most of us want less medical devices on our bodies, not more, right? So what I foresee happening in 2023 is a, a push towards a new innovative approach to having a bionic pancreas be a, an option for the masses without having to rely on multiple sites, multiple different um, things to get caught on doorknobs for being real <laughs> like that's just the real life with diabetes right uh, if you've got tubes running all over the place you run more of a risk of getting caught on things my daughter likes to tug on my insulin pump tubing my cgms the more devices that i wear the more i've got to keep an eye on them which also means it's pulling away from my quality of life right so i want to pull up my notes from our coaching call make sure i didn't miss anything uh, we cover the insulin to protein ratio the insulin to fat resistance component uh, I don't think those are going to be on our insulin pumps anytime soon. 
Honestly speaking, probably never. It's going to be at least a decade before the rest of the medical community catches up with the fact that you do have to consider proteins and fats for our insulin. In fact, when I was first diagnosed, I was told there's five things I don't have to take insulin for. Water, cheese, eggs, meat, and vegetables. Of those five, four of them you do have to take insulin for, or at the very least, consider taking insulin for because they do impact blood sugars. We'll take vegetables as an example. They are obviously referring to more of the cruciferous vegetables, right? The leafy greens. But if you take it in a broad sense, guess what's also a vegetable? A potato. <laughs> That's not going to be carb free, right? You look at proteins, meats, eggs. These are all things that are impacting blood sugars later on. So yes, carbs have the most direct impact, which is why on our insulin pumps, it gives us the option to say how many carbs we are consuming so that based on our insulin to carb ratio, it will suggest how much insulin we should be taking, how many units, right? I doubt that we're going to see any kind of insulin to protein ratios or other forms of insulin input other than insulin to carb, because the reality is the education isn't there. And most people just don't care that much. And those who do are in our programs. And so they're learning about it anyways. And we deal with a lot, a lot of different ways on how to manipulate blood sugars to keep them in range. So insulin to protein ratios on insulin pumps, not going to happen in 2023. It's just not realistic. Bionic pancreas, pancreas adoption, looking at how we can get uh, on a system that enables us to live our best lives is also not going to happen in the next year because in addition to the system being in place, we need insulin that works faster. That's going to be the big hiccup, right? If insulin is not working fast enough, we're not going to be able to use algorithms to go based off of our current situation with blood sugars because the reality is we make choices that will interrupt the algorithm. If we eat spontaneously outside of a specified window of time, the pump has to play catch up. It can't play catch up if the insulin doesn't work fast enough, especially with higher glycemic foods. If you want to go have a fruit smoothie, there's no chance that insulin delivered without a pre-bolus is going to catch up to that. So a lot of these decision making processes still fall on us, the user, the human, as we have to make decisions to best control our blood sugars, uh, counting your carbs, taking the proper amount of insulin, and of course, pre-bolusing or timing your insulin is going to be very helpful for each individual searching for that uh, increased time and range. Now, the third piece, human error, we already covered that, need faster uh, insulins. The last piece, actually, I found was quite uh Funny <laughs> is the best way I can put it. The last piece to this is the trends that we see across consumerism, right? The materialistic collection of things that are cool. There is definitely something to be said about which pumps are cooler, which pumps are part of the quote unquote in crowd, right? Uh, which CGMs are cooler. We see them popping up in commercials all over the place. Which ones are adopted by these quote unquote diabetic influencers? And I'm sure you've seen them or at least familiar faces across the internet, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, all these different places. The reality is that in addition to functionality, we also want something that's cool, right? We want something that doesn't get in the way of our lifestyle. And what I've noticed with these guys right here, cell phones, is that over the years, and I've had quite a few, we've seen trends in cell phones change, right? When I was in high school, well, let's go back a little bit further. When I was in junior high, cell phones became a thing, like a more common thing. And the coolest thing ever was a flip phone. My first phone was a Motorola Razor. I thought it was amazing. In fact, I still have it somewhere in this office. But from a flip phone, they went nuts. They went to like sideways flips and upside down flips. And it just went all different directions to try and find the coolest way to do it. From there, though, in high school, cell phones got super small. Everyone was all about compact. In fact, I had an English teacher who his entire cell phone was like three inches tall. It was hilarious. It was a flip phone. He would use his hands to very gently open it up, punch in a couple numbers, and then hold it up to his ear, which did not make it to his mouth. It was so small that he had to hold it with a pincer grasp, right? And then from there, flash forward five years even, maybe 10 if you really don't want to get into it. Now we've got phones that cover my entire face. Look at this. It is ridiculous. So now the cool thing is large phone devices. Part of the reason for that is media viewing, right? We have social media, we have movies we can watch on our phone, TV, TikTok. As a result, the screens got massive. Now they have touch screens, right? We're moving back towards large phones. 
Similarly to the pumps, I have seen pumps start out as large. Now they're working their way towards smaller pumps. I have a feeling that we're going to work our way towards a slimmer design, but larger interface that allows us to have more customization with our insulin pumps, allows us to have more options and hopefully down the line, more of a, an automated series that takes into consideration multiple factors. So instead of the pump playing catch up, it's actually able to predict effectively and then, of course, deliver insulin that works fast enough to keep us in range without extra input. Now, I believe that we're about a decade away from that. Innovation is great. We are skyrocketing the options for diabetics like myself and like you that are making life easier, right? CGMs, fantastic innovation, insulin pumps that communicate with CGMs, algorithmic based blood sugar control, coolest thing ever, right? It is helpful. However, it's still an assistant. It has yet to become the CEO. I gave this example in one of our coaching calls. These algorithms are like the assistant at a front desk of a big business. You are like the CEO behind the big desk in the back room, right? You have the executive decisions that you're making. If the assistant had to take over the whole business, the business is going to fail. If you rely completely on these algorithms at this moment in time, you're going to fail. Blood sugars, you're not going to cooperate. You're going to have wild roller coaster blood sugars. But alternatively, if the CEO had to fire the assistant and do everything himself or herself, that would be more difficult. So the assistant does serve a purpose. It is beneficial. However, this is uh, still a balanced relationship that we're seeing between the two. Okay, So instead of relying completely on the algorithms, they're not ready for that. They haven't been trained for that. Instead, we want to look at how can we, as the CEO, give the assistant the best information to do their job appropriately until we have more of the training available to then have the assistant take over more of the responsibilities. In other words, in the future, we should have better options for diabetes control with algorithmic based options. But for now, it still relies heavily on us understanding, educating ourselves and taking responsibility for a disease we didn't ask for. But nobody cares about that because the fact is we have diabetes. It is time to start taking control over it, right? So if you're like me and you'd rather take action instead of waiting an unknown period of time for five more years in whatever potential cure or algorithms are out there, instead, we can take control now. Now, I've been able to keep my blood sugars over 90% time in range before and after these algorithms were ever part of my life. Now, there's a very specific reason for that. We use what's called the 80-20 blood sugar formula. We teach all about it, different frameworks that are included all over our YouTube channel. So what I want you to do right now is hit the subscribe button. We put up new videos at least once or twice every single week. We've got tons of information for you, free resources, and of course, opportunities to get more guided approach to your diabetes management. So go ahead, hit subscribe, check our other videos out. They're all over the place. And I hope this one was helpful for you to look ahead at what 2023 and the rest of our future with diabetes might look like. Hope you have an amazing day. Again, my name is Matt Vandevecht. Uh, just like you, uh, a little more obsessed with blood sugars probably. Uh, I love it. And I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. And keep up the fight.